Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Revive Stories. Uh, we've been having so much fun with the series here on Revive TV, chatting to some of the fantastic people at Revive Church. And today is no different. We have got um, Ryan Dykins joining us today, who has, I don't really want to limit Ryan to one ministry, but um, he has been a part of our church for very long. He's been an amazing um, guy to have on team and incredibly funny, incredibly handsome. Um, that's those were words he's asked me to to say. But Ryan, thank you so much for joining us, man. Thanks for the setup, Phil. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's actually a privilege just to be able to maybe share a little bit of my testimony. Um, yeah. uh, when you asked me to sit here, I was I actually sort of realised I haven't shared my testimony as much as I possibly should have. So this mm. is actually a, quite a privilege. Thank you. Fantastic, man. Yeah, I think the whole premise of what we try to do at Revive Stories is we really believe in the power um, of our stories, the power of our experiences and how God has moved throughout our lives all differently and in different ways. But we know that we can be encouraged and inspired uh, by the amazing people um, around us in the body of Christ. So how I love to start these off, Ryan, is I like to just ask a little bit about um, your upbringing, man. Where did you grow up? Um, what was what was childhood like? And then we can um, maybe get into some of the finer things after that. Okay, perfect. Um, so I guess I was incredibly blessed. And um, yeah, I grew up in a very wealthy family in KZN, uh, formerly known as Natal. And uh, yeah, I, I was born in 82. So that puts me just on uh, 41 at the moment. Spring chicken. Um, yeah, <laughs> spring chicken. Yeah, I still got loads of strength for church planting. No strength. <laughs> but um yeah, I was. I really did have it easy, maybe. Uh, all the privilege, um, and yeah, born born in Westville, moved into the Berea. Uh, later in my late teens, lived a little bit in Manichkam, but I was also at boarding school. Um, yeah, just uh, after school, had a, a jaunt in Zanzibar on a working year. Uh, because I got very involved in scuba diving and uh, and yacht skippering and sailing. Okay. And uh, yeah, I came back in, what was it, 2001, and I decided to study in Cape Town. So I went to UCT, started in the commerce faculty, and uh, yeah, I just really, um, that, that was actually probably my first encounter with God when I had all the choice to myself. Uh, wow. I actually ended up getting involved in a, um, I can't be rude, but it was at church um, on campus. And uh, later now, obviously, many, many years later, I realized there were some things that were wrong with their fundamentals. But yeah, I was I was kind of searching for God from, for, from my early years. My family was um, not, uh, they didn't have a faith or a religion. Uh, I think at the time it was kind of like the the social thing, the, the socially accepted thing to write Anglican when mm. when your child went to school. It was like you were just Anglican because that was the fad, that was the fashion, mm. and um, yeah. But it didn't stop me from being curious throughout my school years, and also even just paying attention when I was in chapel at school and certainly at boarding school. I, I tried to sort of keep my eyes open, my ears open, and learn and. I felt myself being pulled even as far back as high school. Um, wow. Yeah, and uh, I so I had a bit of a rocky start at university level, and uh, yeah, things didn't go as well as planned. Um, I I think may may have been uh, attacked, you know, supernaturally. I think I was feeling an incredible amount of shame for the life that I was living, sure. and uh, it drove me away from the church that I was a part of at the time and uh, nothing nothing wrong with the people people were awesome just I think their theology needed some tuning mm. um, and then in the end I actually I became very hard-hearted to yeah. any faith to any God I still prayed from time to time um, but it was when it suited me it's the typical like okay I need some help now pray um, you know like I got this business meeting. I'd really like this to be successful. It's all about me, of course, and all of that. Yeah, yeah, Ryan. That's um, that's that's really interesting. And um, even there, you touched on going through a moment of 
um, feeling, you know, a bit of shame, feeling maybe even some guilt and that having an effect on your views on church and even on God. Mm -hmm. I think the question that, I, that I'd love to know is, um, was there a moment or uh, a place or a person that you met that maybe started to um, shape that and change that, that it became less about your past and your actions, but more about um, God and the relationship that you could have? I don't know if, there was a, if there's a moment in time that you can kind of pinpoint. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite clear. Um, I think for me, I moved. So I studied in Cape Town. I moved back to Durban, worked in Durban, moved back to Cape Town, worked in Cape Town. And, and that brings us up to about 2008. I met Catherine, who is now my wife. And, um, you know, she and I dated for quite a while. And I think the, the gap between where I was and where I'm at now is I lived my life for myself. I kind of said, well, you know, I tried that. It didn't go as planned. It felt really weird. I got out of it fully and I was like, Ish, I'm scared to go back and try something like that. But all the time between university and sort of 2008, I could never get away from that uh, compulsion that there was something missing. And it didn't stop me. I still prayed. I still tried every now and then to communicate with God and I never really opened the Bible or anything like that. I had Bibles on the shelf but they just sat there. Um yeah, I got so fast track forward to two thousand eight and I met Catherine and we dated and Catherine has a very faith filled family. And she was quite comfortable talking about her faith. And I was kind of like, I'd reached the point maybe of hard heartedness where I was a little, little bit indifferent. I was like, yeah, you know, okay, you do you. Uh, I'm not going to try to change you. It's who you are and I'll accept it. And then I suppose over time, maybe uh, what I come to understand now is maybe it was the Holy Spirit softening my heart. Um, conversations crept back there and, um, you know, one day she actually turned around at, a couple of, couple of years go in and one day she turned around to me and she said, you know, like, what's the most, what's the thing you want most in the world? It was a very philosophical conversation. I think we were already 35 minutes in and she pulls that one out the bag and I'm like, you know what? Uh, it's it's going to sound weird, but I really want to know the truth about God. And she was like, cool, that's awesome. You know, if you have any questions, you must chat to me. And then um, uh, that was just part of it. Anyway, we get along, we get engaged, we're planning our wedding. All the while, and unbeknownst to me, her family are flat out praying for me. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we get to the wedding and it was incredible. We had a lot of fun, but it was also very secular, very worldly. Uh, very debauched. We had a lot of friends in from uh, around the country and we landed up drinking way too much in the run into the week of the wedding and all the rest. Um, come the day after the wedding, I was absolutely finished. If I could say I was at my lowest point I'd ever experienced, I had full on, and this is after my wedding day, I had full on like a depression, I had full on like anxiety, uh, I was in an absolute mess. And again, found myself looking up at heaven and saying, yes, I think you're there. Help me out, Chad, because this is supposed to be a highlight in my life. And right now I feel like a mess. What's going on? It got so bad and you, could, you feel free to have a laugh at me, but I checked myself into the trauma unit at Blaberg Hospital and I looked at the guy and I said, this is, these are my symptoms. This is how I feel. And the guy laughed at me. He said, but you got a bad hangover. And uh, <laughs> I said, well, look, I'm not arguing, but this feels like a little more. And uh, long story short, I nearly missed or made myself and Catherine miss our flights. We were due to go off to Mauritius on honeymoon. And uh, we got there and I was messy. I was so anxious and filled with energy. And I just, I wasn't good company. The first night we got there, we got there late um, and I couldn't sleep. So I ended up staying up all night. The next night, we're sitting down at this romantic seafood restaurant at the hotel. And I cannot keep my eyes open. I'm absolutely messed up. I could not stay awake. I was literally falling asleep. I needed matchsticks to keep my eyes open. And Catherine's all excited and she is so irate with me because 
I'm literally ruining what she sees as like the first step of the rest of our lives. And I'm like, okay, at some point in that evening, I said, okay, I, I, need a, I need the bathroom. And I got up and I walked outside. And I didn't go to the bathroom. I walked into the open air outside where it was quiet. And I started pacing. And I started pacing. I'm like, you are not going to start out your life like this. Catherine deserves better than this. Uh, you can't mess this up. This is, what's wrong with you? Like, I was really angry with myself. And I started praying. And... Um, I started saying to God, you know, like, I need to be rescued. I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm completely incapable. I feel useless. I don't know, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. I'm on my own here. I need help. And uh, anyway, I went back to the table. It didn't, it, God didn't magically keep me awake. Uh, we ended up having to leave food at the table and disappear. And I crashed and all the anxiety started bouncing off the walls. Um, and it was quite interesting that at that moment, where, which I'd probably call one of, if not the lowest moments of my life, um, I carried on praying and I almost pushed through it. And I had this moment where I had this incredible sense of peace. And I also had this amazing feeling of safety and I believe I saw um, a lot of white light. Now, it's very difficult to explain. It also happened many, many, many years ago. But I, re I recall feeling like all of a sudden, all the worry was gone. And I mentioned this to Catherine, and it was like I felt so loved. It was the most insane feeling that I've ever felt in my life. And I mentioned to Catherine, and she said, you know what? Um you've been praying, maybe your prayers have been answered, maybe something's happening here. And we got talking and talking and I, I left Honeymoon, long story short, I left Honeymoon with this absolute commitment and drive to go to church. It was just as simple as that. It was my next step was get into a church fast. And I, I actually annoyed Catherine. I was like, come on, when are we doing this? Which church are we going to? Where are we going? And um, we, we went to an alpha course in rugby uh, and Catherine nearly tripped over a man-sized rat on the curb and she panicked and I think that was the end of that experience. And then um, the following week we tried, uh, we got it wrong and I think we landed up at the youth service in the evenings in Tableview View Church. It was on a recommendation from her, her parents because they knew that View at the time was quite contemporary. And, but we got it wrong, went to the wrong service, and I sat there, and I was like, ah, this is not my scene. I was like rocking myself because everyone had their hands up, and they were praising God and singing loudly, and I was like, this is not what I was expecting. This is not what I was expecting. And uh, anyway, I couldn't get rid of that feeling. It was so, it was such a huge drive. I had to try again, and then someone there mentioned, no, there's a Sunningdale campus. So we hit Sunningdale evening service back in 2011 somewhere. And, um, yeah, I never looked back. Honestly, it was such a cool, like, got into church, uh, listened. Like, I, I didn't miss a single service. I listened to everything that was said by Graham, by Sven, by whomever was speaking. Immediately felt con compelled or convicted to get water baptized. And, yeah, it was just one thing led to another. Hey, um, I... I made. I kind of had made my decision because I couldn't ignore the reality of how I had uh, what I think of as like a Paul moment, uh, where it's almost like something smashes you inside and you cannot ignore it anymore. It's this is happening. This is what's just happened. I prayed. I got an answer. I I can't ignore that, and I've stuck with it. And every yeah, you know, every time I attend a church service or every time I attend a life group or, um, you know, some kind of church community event. It's amazing how things just tie up. And I, there's never been a moment where I've said to myself, like, okay, this is maybe okay, this is maybe not okay. It's always been, this is a great fit. And I cannot deny how it's improved my life. Never, ever will I deny that my life is on a completely different track because of it. It's an incredibly, incredibly positive influence. Yeah. If I can ask, maybe um, you mentioned Catherine 
a little bit there and 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 the role that she's played what has been you know what has been a, a great positive about having someone that you're married to um that's also you know wanting to take steps forward um with god and growing in their personal relationship and maybe what were some of the influences or even you know to this day um how do you guys um influence each other you know for the better because of you've got this joint purpose of you know wanting to be god led and uh, christ centered in your family and in your marriage yeah i i think we it's taken a long time to learn this because both of us have had to mature along the way. Um, both of us, almost Catherine had that faith background, but had never developed her spiritual maturity. And then I jumped on as, as, a, as a baby Christian. And then we kind of like grew together and then in fits and starts and not always evenly. But what was amazing throughout this whole process is, uh, A, we both realized that we are completely fallible. Like we are definitely not perfect. Um, B, we realized that without forgiveness in our marriage, um, it was never going to grow and never going to mature and never going to last. Um, and then came a lot of teaching, which was given to us by the church as well. Uh, all the marital teaching and the courses and the, uh, the different uh, literature that we've been given. And it's, it's so clear how when you have two individuals who both see God as number one and thereafter seek to put the other before themselves uh, Andy, Andy Stanley says it quite well he says it's a it's a race to the back of the line um, where you where you, you know, if you're continually putting the other person first um, and that person is continually putting you first it's a complementary action that honors God and um, it's difficult to explain until you experience it but truthfully um, having a partner who's as committed to the church as I am or has complimented me in seasons when I've served hard and then I try to compliment her when she needs to do uh, those things, it makes a lot possible. It really is. And it's, it's definitely been, a, you know, Jesus' cornerstone of our marriage. Um, so we try and model everything around him and, and what his marital model looks like. I love that. Jeez, that's really good, man. Really good wisdom. Um, and maybe even as we begin to wrap up, um, I love asking this question, um, kind of based on on maybe your life and your experiences and your journeys, the ups and the downs um, in your walk with God, what type of advice uh, would you give? Um, the first bit of advice, and normally this advice is always shaped by the lessons that we've had to learn often in the valleys or even on the mountaintops. What bit of advice would you give to any believers or, you know, new to faith people that could find this video today? I would say, without a doubt, don't ever let shame be a stumbling block between you and building a relationship with, with your God. I think that that is a tool that the evil one uses and it's so easy to put you in a corner just by you using your own shame and throwing up a mirror and showing you how evil you can be or have been. Um, I am far from perfect, done a lot of bad things and yet found forgiveness through biblical teaching and the people that I serve and do church with and do life with. And um, it puts you on the right track. It puts you on the narrow path. Uh, it's, it's just, don't, don't get lost in shame. Shame is not worthwhile. Oh, man, that's fantastic. Ryan, thank you so much, man. This has been such an awesome conversation. I appreciate your, your honesty. And again, you know, I want to say it every time we do these, these episodes, it's that our stories are powerful. Our stories are different and there's power in sharing the story. Um, and I know that even the story that you've taken the time to share is going to go a long way. And we pray that, um, some people who really needed to hear this and this encouragement find this video today. But Ryan, thanks, man. We appreciate you. Thanks, Phil. Take care. Awesome. We'll see you guys soon. Cheers.